Great. Um, yes, please free, feel free to eat your lunch um, or your breakfast. Um, and um, as I said at the beginning, this is our version of sort of a book club. So it's very relaxed. Um, and um, um, I will let uh, Xiaoping get us started. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, joining this session. So it is breakfast time for me <laughs> on the West Coast. Uh, I'm in Seattle. Um, last night was actually some snow, you know, uh, can you imagine? <laughs> anyway, I'm very happy to um, talk about the interesting phenomenon called Mo Qi on today and share my my paper, the paper was published um, uh, with you. So uh, it might be a little sort of academic because uh, it's a paper, but I would uh, welcome any questions that you have. On uh, Okay, let me make it to the presentation mode. Yes, all right. Um, okay, so a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in China, um, and I got my like all the degrees till master's degree in China, Hangzhou Zhejiang University. Then I came to the U.S. Um, I went to University of Illinois and got another master's degree and a PhD in psychology. So my training um, was in psychology, and after. That I went to um, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, joined the faculty in the business school, uh, and worked there for three years. It was a very, very happy three years. Um, it was from 1995 to 1998. So I actually was, witnessed the um, that transition time. Um, and after three years, we decided to come back to the U.S. So I joined the faculty at uh, Indiana University, Bloomington, Kelly School of Business. Uh, but then uh, we just felt it was too peaceful and quiet uh, there. Uh, we decided to move to a city. So uh, I then um, joined the fa faculty at the University of Washington, and that was 1999. So it was almost like 25 years ago. Unbelievable. <laughs> so it's uh, at the University of Washington, I got my uh, tenure, you know, uh, and then I became a uh, department chair for almost nine years, then I became associate dean uh, for four years, and then I uh, finally finished my service. Um, <laughs> um, currently, I'm, I'm no longer uh, having any administrative jobs. Uh, I focus my research and my journals. Um, okay, so about today's um, topic, the title is, the, the key word is, is mo qi. But mo qi is actually a Chinese word. Um, and what is mo qi? I have like a bunch of Chinese expressions here. I know maybe only Jeff can under understand. And this first one says, xin that means if we understand each other, we don't need to say anything. We just like uh, say maybe one word or one make one sound and we immediately understand each other. And this one, xin ling xun hui, means that our heart knows each other and our mind also knows each other. <laughs> <laughs> and this one, xin zhao bu xian, means like we understand each other, but we don't need to say anything. Um, okay, and so on and so on, right? Um, and we, a, a very, I think, a common and familiar situation we know that actually reflects the notion of mo qi is this situation. You know, these two people, they work together for a long time, and when they are in performance, they don't need to say anything, just one little, like, you know, eye contact or a touch here, a touch there, they know it immediately what it meant, right? Um, so mochi is the, this is the perfect reflection of the mochi uh, notion. All right, um, but from the um, sort of academic perspective or from the phenomenon driven sort of uh, approach in studying something, we try to identify what this mochi is, right? So um, it is interesting, some of my colleagues, um, uh, you know, because mo qi, this word is so, um, so common in the Chinese language. If you say mo qi, every, almost everyone knows what it means. But when we think about an English word that can sort of represent that um, phenomenon, 
we just couldn't find one. <laughs> okay, so that, that was uh, a little bit of a challenge because normally we would use an English word to describe a phenomenon so people understand e easily. But when we have this mochi phenomenon, we just couldn't find. So that's why we put mochi, the pinyin form of the two Chinese characters here. And some of my colleagues um, noticed this phenomenon in the workplace and they they found that, you know, uh, they're between supervisors and uh, subordinates. Some of them actually have mochi and some of them don't. Uh, so if they have mochi, they understand each other easily and they have better sort of feelings about each other and so on and so forth. And that would influence the performance outcomes, uh, trust and so on. Um, so in that paper, which I was not a, a co-author, although they invited me, <laughs> But I wasn't uh, so convinced at the time. Anyway, so they published this paper in um, Journal of Management. And the good thing about the first paper about Mochi is that uh, they did a good job to distinguish between the meaning of Mochi and other existing constructs in management or in organizational behavior. So because uh, in our field, we already have all these um, constructs we call the established construct like a leader member exchange on uh, personal uh, supervisor like a fit right or implicit coordination or transactive memory systems i'm not going to get into these constructs at this moment if you're interested you can um, read the paper and find out so so what is mochi i have this picture here that is huh <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think there's a Japanese um, uh, term like huh and ah, that's the mochi thing. Okay, so huh and ah, so you, you both understand each other. Um, and this concept is different from these notions, all right, in our literature. Um, so in our um, paper about mochi, um, we, so my co-author, Benjamin Cole, he he grew up in, in the US, um, but he spent quite a few years in Japan. So it was quite interesting that he could understand. He observed the Japanese people. They say very little, but they, you know, they work with each other pretty smoothly without saying too much. Uh, so when we I talked about this mochi thing and he immediately said, yes, yes, it resonates with me, like my observation in Japan. So, wow. So let's just work on this paper together. Okay, that's how we uh, work together. Uh, in this paper, we clearly define what mochi is and what mochi is not. So uh, first we say, uh, just sort of introduce the concept, right? It has two Chinese characters. The first one is more, more means silence, silent. Uh, the second word is qi. Qi means fit or agreement. All right. So in that sense, mo qi is a communication between two people, uh, but without words, right? No words. <laughs> and if you communicate with another person using the contextual cues or body language in the communication literature, we call this a high context communication. So in that sense, mochi is a type of high context communication. Um, make sense? If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, so in terms of high context communication, I, I think you guys know very well, you know, about Edward Hall's work and his definition of high context communication, low context communication, and so on and so forth. And that is exactly what we do with our IC edge tool to measure right, the different domains of context. And then our assessment can reflect your communication style in terms of a high context or low context in one of these four domains. Okay, um, so you probably uh, are very familiar with this um, definition, so I'm not going to uh, read it aloud. All right, uh, so, Sort of defining mochi in as a high level, a high context communication, then we 
need to sort of distinguish this mochi phenomenon from the general high contact communication thing, right? Uh, so here we provide a theoretical definition of mochi, that is when two people engage in high contact communication using no words and it can reach shared understanding about a specific target. Um, for example, a person, an object, an incident in a specific situation they are said to have mochi. Um, so this picture, okay, anyway, you know, a boy and girl, they have mochi and, and they feel like, you know, they should fell in love pretty easily or, you know, something like that. Um, uh, all right, so theoretical definition of mochi, the key word here is shared understanding between two people, right? Uh, without saying anything. So um, in that case, uh, it involves one sort of notion called a perspective taking. Uh, so in psychology, uh, there's a lot of research actually about perspective taking. That is the individuals switch mindset uh, and put themselves into another person's shoes, right? And say, mm, what would that person do in this situation? And how would that person feel in that situation? So you imagine yourself to be in that person's uh, situation and then allow that reflection to inform their own agency. So how should I treat this person if I'm in that position? Now I'm here. Uh, so that is the perspective taking uh, construct. We, we say that mochi um, is um, one more step further than perspective taking. So of course, you know, um, so here, Two people, right? Um, the same individuals would ask this, like, what would party A want me to do in that situation? And what would that person want to have happen in that situation? So not only we have a sh sort of under similar understanding about the situation, but I also will ask these two questions, then um, act in accordance with that reflection. Um, so in that sense, mochi is not just a state of perspective taking, but rather a state of perspective taken alignment, both in mindset and in action. So for example, like I think my co-author encountered the situation. <laughs> he, he said, um, although like in the US, we don't talk about mochi, you know, this particular phenomenon, but he, he had not such a great relationship with it's so his department chair, right? And um, his associate dean in the school, he said they don't have a good relationship. And he also knows something that that person did that was not very good. Um, and so in the staff meetings, like um, they, they were talking about certain plans and so on and so forth, but he was not very happy about that. Um, and he would look at the like associate. <laughs> he wanted to change his opinion. Anyway, it, we look at uh, the associate in certain way to let him know that you know if I um, I expose something about you like in the meeting, then there's no way that you can get your um, plan done, right? Um, but that look itself, um, the associate dean would understand perfectly, uh, so that. He will switch his position to be more in alignment with my um, my co-author <laughs> because um, they both know in that situation that if he doesn't speak about that uh, some particular thing, you know, they all knew, uh, then his face will be saved. And now he acts in alignment with my co-author's position then that thing will be kept in secret. So that's mochi. <laughs> did, did I explain clearly? Okay, I think you encountered some of the situation before, right? Um, in that case, it was more of a sort of a rival kind, not really rival, just it's not like they are friends, they have mochi. Because in most of the situations, it's like we're friends and we have come an understanding about something we don't need to talk about it. And I know exactly what you want me to do in that situation. And I'll just do it. Uh, so that's mochi in a um, sort of more common kind of uh, situation. Uh, 
uh, that situation is a little bit different but it's still mochi. That's why we uh, also talk about mochi can happen between friends, um, uh, between people you know very, very well, but this know very, very, very well people could be friends or could be even enemies or rivals. All right. Okay, so um, another thing we want to emphasize is that mochi is target specific and situation specific. That means that in one particular situation, for example, when you're, you, you guys are talking about performance evaluation, for example, um, about one specific person, and because this person's performance has been you know, not so good in the past, so very easily, because in the past you have discussed this several times, so this time, again, this person performs um, poorly, you will be able to, about that person, reach agreement pretty quickly, maybe even without any discussion. And see, this happens again, and we'll do the same thing, right? Uh, so it could be person-specific, and it has to be situation-specific as well. That is, this is about that person's performance evaluation, uh, and we achieved mochi about that person, what should we do about this person? But if it's a different thing, it's no longer a performance evaluation, but other incidents, for example, sexual harassment or you know, things like that, then not necessarily you will still have mochi about that person or situation. And then, um, so in that sense, mochi is not only target specific, but is also situation specific. All right. Um, yeah, so I talk about the example. So in that sense, mochi is an emergent state informed by prior situations. Yes, so mochi is not automatic, right? Oftentimes, it needs a lot of interaction beforehand between two people. And then at a certain point, you reach mochi. Okay, but of course, sometimes we feel mm, not necessarily uh, I meet a new person, when we talk about something, immediately we are connected, you know? We have that kind of um, magical feeling that we know each other for a long time. <laughs> so that could also happen, but uh, how that would happen, we'll, we'll explain in our model. Uh, I know this looks pretty daunting, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it's, the, uh, it's all the things that I explained earlier. Uh, so we are focusing on this, uh, part of the model now, what is mochi? So mochi is a context, contextualized understandings of whatever happened in the past, right? And then now a new situation occurs and there is overlap between this situation and the earlier contextualized understanding you achieve about the person, then these two people will have mochi easily. Um, however, if the new situation is very different, like this piece here, than the uh, previous situations, then you're likely to engage with other guesswork. Say, hey, in the past, you know, similar things happen. Uh, what I think that person would do or think. So that's this state. And here is um, if the um, new situation has nothing to do with the previous contextualized understandings about person or <laughs> Or situation, then we would ignore that um, due to irrelevance because it, it's a completely say, new uh, situation. We don't know what's going to happen, and I don't know what my partner would think about the situation. Okay, and only this piece, the overlap between the two, uh, we call it the two people both would be likely to engage in perspective taken aligned activity, which is more cheap. Okay. So that is this part of the model. And then we will talk about what would <laughs> make this happen, right? Uh, so the antecedents of mochi. All right. Um, but before we talk about the antecedents of mochi, oh, David, you have a question. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Yes, thank yes. you. Uh, simple question, but it, it, it'll help me think a little bit mm -hmm. more about it. Even, of course, it's a Chinese term, so it can be used contextualized in a Chinese utterance, a statement in using Chinese language. But yes. with respect mm. to the to the English translation, yeah. 
you yes. you use the expression um, have mochi. Uh, yo, in mm. Chinese, is it yo mochi? Is yo, how do yo you mochi. yo yes, mochi? Yes. Okay, mm, okay. Mm. So in yes. English, in English, mm. it would be the same idea of a possession of a condition of in a yes. certain sense. Okay, that's right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Mm. Okay. Thank you. That Thank helps you. a lot. Mm-hmm. Your Chinese is very good. <laughs> so in this sense, like mochi is a noun, right? It's a state of, you know, uh, have achieved a mutual agree, mutual understanding. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about like what much is not. Uh, there are some similar. So earlier we talked about like, uh, leader member exchange, you know, it's different, right? Personal uh, person to provide the fit is different. Implicit or foreign engine, different transactive memory system is different. So we're not going to talk about these in our paper. But also um, people would say, hey, is this similar to mind reading? Uh, and we say, no, which is not mind reading. Because <laughs> according to my research, mind readers are those born with an extraordinary ability like six cents to understand what others think, feel, believe, want, and know. But not necessarily. They will take according action on uh, based on that. So uh, which is not my reading. And much is also not trust, uh, because trust is defined as a psychological state comprising the intention to accept vulnerability based upon positive expectations of the intentions or behavior of another. Um, but it's not, it has nothing to do with um, perspective taking or alignment or action. So it's not trust. But we probably can predict if the two people have mochi and have mochi uh, about a lot of things, they probably will be easy, easier than others, right, to develop trust. Did you see um, Rebecca's question, Xiaoping? Uh, uh, no, I didn't see the hand. Um, okay, ask. Yeah. She, oh, she she says, "Is it the same as mochi uh, in Korean?" Oh, right. really? Same. I, I was I was trying to understand the difference. Um, since you mentioned in Japanese culture something, but I had lived in Korea, you know, quite a long time, so I was trying to understand the differences. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know in Korean what they uh, call this type of kind of state situation. Like two people understand each other without saying a word. Did you hear? Or do they also use mochi? They they have this nunchi term, but I sometimes they call it like a mind reading. So that's why you said mochi is not mind reading. Not mind, yeah, not mind reading. Because mind reading is that, yeah, I know, I can guess what you are thinking and so on and so forth. But not necessarily will, I will take action in alignment with that. So the mochi is one step further that I know what you're thinking and I understand what you want me to do to be, you know, to, to get to something. So I don't need to ask you or tell you, I just do it. So that actually happens a lot in Chinese companies when a secretary has worked with the CEO, for example, for a long time. The secretary can guess what the CEO wants, and they just do it. And afterwards, the CEO find, wow, it's already done. Oh my god, you know. So that that kind of mochi, yeah. <laughs> uh, so in Japanese, we call it like ah uh, ooh, just the two words. <laughs> so it's the question mark and it's the exclamation mark. Huh? Oh, okay. Yeah, we understand. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um. So hopefully that this helps, like uh, you know, distinction between some existing uh notion, which you know of uh mochi and and these. Does that help, Rebecca? Yes. I I think I will read a bit more about the mochi. I think that will help me to to. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very new to me, so I will read more first. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, Patricia. Yes. I see your hand. 
Mm, maybe she accidentally hit the hand. All right. Uh, let me just go on. <laughs> uh, so we discussed what are the potential antecedents of mochi. Um, and to us, because this is between two people, so it's at the dyadic level. We only talk about dyadic level mochi because um, at some point, you know, people would say the group will have mochi, right? Like as a group, we know exactly at what point we need to do what, and we don't need to talk about it. We just do it. Um, but in this paper, we only restrict itself to the dyadic mochi. So here we say um, most important to this mix is the repeated meaningful interactions between two people. And so this interaction would include both verbal communication and verb nonverbal communication and nonverbal and behavior itself is also nonverbal, right? Um, so both verbal and nonverbal that facilitate the creation of shared understanding between two parties. Um, and we put meaningful interaction is that uh, sometimes we, we do interact with others, but would you say hello, say bye, and say, yeah, how are you doing? Very shallow kind of uh, interaction, right? Meaningful interaction means that you actually um, talk about a lot of, we see like pretty deep level stuff. Um, and that through that interaction, you will be able to understand other people's motivations, norms, expectations, and so on and so forth. So that is um, very, very important. Um, so meanwhile, other, we say, individual characteristics would also influence the extent to which you are more likely or less likely to form sort of mochi with another person. And these things uh, include a person's capability to read you know, nonverbal things. Uh, some people are very sensitive to other people's emotions, facial expressions, body movement. Some people don't. They, they just listen to the words that they say. They think that is it, you know. <laughs> then in that sense, it's very difficult for that person to develop mochi. Um, and the second one is the, um, the inclination to see oneself as a vehicle of communication. So that means sometimes... Um, when we feel it is very difficult to talk to a person uh, directly, like I want to point out some problems that person has, but it's very difficult for me to say directly uh, in that person's face. So I will use, uh, I will ask maybe the best friend of that person to talk to the person, right? So in that case, you you need to have the ability to, to view yourself as a vehicle of this communication, you know. <laughs> so this um, more subtle kind of way of communicating a message um, need to be aware of. And the third one is um, the ability to view oneself as like a piece of fabric of interdependent with other people. So that's the uh, self-construal, the extent to which we view ourselves as a part of like a social relationship or um, view ourselves mainly in terms of our role in the in work or in the society or in social life, then you're more likely to to sense these nonverbal things. You know, um, so we call this. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more uh, about the self construal um, concept, and then uh, finally the skill to interpret message um, like in the context, not the message the literal meaning of message itself. Okay, so um, in terms of individual messaging style, uh, in our paper, we talked about indirectness uh, and inclusiveness, right? The message context itself includes two dimensions. One is indirectness, one is inclusiveness. So indirectness means that whether you convey a message to another person directly or indirectly, indirectly meaning you use a different way, not, or like ask a different person, for example, that's indirect way of communicating your message to that person. Implicitness means that the words you use are, whether the words you use are like very specific, explicit, clear, simple, or you use um, abstract, vague words that people have a lot of room to, to guess like what it means. Uh, so inclusiveness is that. So these two uh, concepts are different. 
obviously, if you understand this <laughs> and you are good with this, <laughs> you're more likely to form mochi with another person. Um, interdependent self construct I talked a little bit ab uh, about this earlier. Uh, this means the extent how we define ourselves or how we view ourselves in terms of our relationship with other people, right? So here, this is the independent view of self. That is, you view, uh, you view yourself as an independent entity and you see yourself having a lot of distinguished attributes that you have, but other people don't. See, other people also have X, but their X is different from your X. So you see yourself as very unique, um, and unique and independent person. All right. And for an interdependent self person, they view themselves as in connection with all other people, you know, in their life, uh, inseparable, inseparable. They are not independent inseparable and also as you can see they view these attributes these are the attributes that you have and you see other people also have these attributes as the most important characteristics of themselves so you emphasize your connection with other people and you view yourself as part of this social connection not an independent entity here as you can see here this uh, line is solid yourself is independent. And here, this line is a uh, dash. I mean, is other people's connection with you, other people's view about you will all enter your self definition. See? So if you have a strong interdependent self, then you're more likely to be more sensitive to other people's doing, other people's characteristics, and other people's uh, evaluation of you. Um, so you sort of naturally just pay attention to other people more and that means you will pick the cues more easily about what other people mean although they are saying certain things okay anyway so i hope that makes sense <laughs> so we have like a bunch of propositions these are all about uh, antecedents to um, mochi development so interdependent self control understanding of how indirect messages are um, delivered or understanding of how implicit messages are delivered. These are uh, in we call antecedent. All right, so um, then in terms of, um, furthermore, if we add the cultural element, so cultural metacognition um, is also another, you see, antecedent to mochi development because in, you guys know, on CQ, right? Cultural intelligence. So in CQ, there are four things. One is the metacognitive CQ, and that is basically cultural metacognition. And that is the mental process directly directed toward acquiring, comprehending, and calibrating cultural knowledge. That is to what extent you are willing to modify your previous perception about the culture based on new information that you receive um, through your interaction with people from that culture or through your reading or you know just observing and so on and so forth. That is to what extent you do not have a fixed view about another culture or another person. The flexibility, okay, flexibility in modifying that, um, that cognition about uh, other culture. So, and, and Similarly, the global dexterity um, notion is similar to this. That is, you do have the flexibility and you want to pay attention to the details or the nuances in a culture and to form your perception about the world. So these um, factors are also to us important antecedents to the development of mochi. Um, okay, so we have this proposition there. And then um, the shared understanding uh, piece, which is the interpersonal interaction, that is, of course, so important, right? No matter how much like uh, individual sort of um, capability that you have in perceiving others and communication cues and so on and so forth, without real interaction with that person, it's, of course, you don't know to what extent that person will actually have mochi with you 
uh, about a person, an object, or an incident. All right, so repeated meaningful interaction is the most important component um, in terms of helping two people to develop shared understanding. All right, um, so um, an another thing we proposed, we tried to have like a sort of comprehensive list of potential factors that could influence that. Another uh, notion that is often talked about in cross-cultural psychology is the tendency of mixing personal and professional life, right? We know like in the United States, um, oftentimes people separate these two things. That is work is work, life is life. So my work colleagues are my work colleagues. You know, I have a lot of interactions in the workplace with them. Um, but in my personal life, I have another bunch of friends, you know, we don't talk about work, we talk about all family, uh, these kind of things, right? Uh, that is quite, so separation between work and life, that tendency in the US is quite different for, uh, than people in China, because I remember all my friends were my work colleagues, basically. <laughs> so we work during the weekdays, right, um, together, doing all kinds of things. Then on weekends, we will just go to movies together. We go to parks together and our family have, uh, you know, dinner together. So the personal life and professional life in some cultures, they are not separated. They are mixed together and people feel very comfortable about that. Uh, so as, as you can imagine, if in a culture, so like in China, people, most people have this high tendency of mixing personal and professional life. Of course, you understand your counterparty so much better, right? And at a much deeper level. So in that sense, it'll be easier for you to develop more chi with them um, than in a different culture. All right. Um, another factor that is relevant is the face concerns. To what extent you have this um, concern about like you don't want to make other people lose face and you want to save other people's face you don't want people feel embarrassed you know when you say something so if you have a high concern about face saving you are more likely to use implicit words or using nonverbal cues to express your meaning to avoid conflict and avoid face losing face, right? So if you do that a lot, people will, will understand even when you do not say it explicitly, just using your, um, just reading from your nonverbal cues, they understand what you, do, you mean in that particular situation. So it will help you to develop more chi with another person. Okay, so all of these factors are pre, um, antecedents. Um, another thing that is pretty key to interpersonal communication is this um, model that is, it has this very important um, match between how I encode a message and how you decode a message, right? So when I convey a message to you, I will think about how I, should I explain it? What kind of examples should I use? And this is all the encoding process. So the encoding process is based on my personal background, my personal uh, work experience, my personal cultural experience, and so on. And when okay, I was muted <laughs> because of the noise, I guess. Uh, now, uh, so when you receive my message, you need to decode my message. And when you decode my message, you will rely on your personal experience, your personal background, your cultural uh, upbringing and your work experience and so on, right? So when your decoding process is different or does not match my encoding process, you will not be able to understand me 100%. Yes? <laughs> okay. So in that situation, this encoding process and decoding process, their match is extremely important. Um, that's why we, we say that sometimes um, 
when we never even meet each other, but because we share a lot of common background. For example, you, like if you were born in China and you were raised in China, then you came to the US, you know, got your degree just like me, then very quickly we will achieve more chi, right? <laughs> and also, <laughs> so, so basically we say, uh, similarity between two people would be very, very important because this shared background um, between you and another person uh, in terms of like demographic characteristics and also, so we start with demographic uh, uh, characteristics, right? Or similar age and gender, you know, race and so on and so forth. It's much easier for us to develop more chi, that shared understanding than um, in a different case. And moreover, um, professional, organizational, acculturation similarity. So that is like if we are all in the accounting business, right? And we all went through the accounting school, you know, had that training and did a lot of cases and so on and so forth. So it will be much easier for us to achieve mochi than I'm a management scholar and you are an accounting uh, scholar. It's harder. But if... And you are all doctors, right? All lawyers, and immediately that similarity in your training would provide a very good background for you to achieve more chi uh, more quickly than you with a, a different person. All right, so we have that. Um, and also, um, we talk about national cultural similarity. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, if we all were raised in the same culture, it's much easier for us to achieve more chi than not okay so um so these are the ant potential antecedents of mochi then we talk about the uh, potential consequences of mochi um i just go through quickly so if once two people have mochi and we say it will be positively related to their communication efficiency right we don't even need to say some, anything and we understand each other very very efficient or oh, i say one word you immediately <laughs> yes i got it um and so through which, because communication efficiency is so crucial uh, to work efficiency. Because I don't know if you um, ask your like students or your clients like how much time you spent on communication in your work. So think about like you know five days, eight days, uh, eight hours a, a day. How much time do you spend there? Most people like if you're a manager or like especially when you are higher level like executives. 90% of your work is actually communication with other people, right? So if that's the case, then if you can increase your communication efficiency, your work efficiency can be, of course, uh, increased. And much will be also be positively related to the feelings of intimate, um, like bonding, like, like, hey, we know each other, you know? Uh, although we haven't really talked that much, but like through all these interactions, I feel you just, we can reach agreement so easily and sometimes you know even without words that positive effect uh, would be developed and also um what you will be positively related to we say feelings of transactional in like indebtedness between rivals in a mochi diet reducing rivalry uh temperation so, so that is the uh my co-author's experience right uh he had that not the great you know, relationship with, with his associate dean, but through that incident, <laughs> they reached Mochi. So afterwards, actually, it was better. The relationship was better. <laughs> uh, yeah, very interesting. So um, the whole model is like that. So we talked about this piece earlier, and in this box, it's all about the antecedents of Mochi. And here are like several um, potential consequences of Mochi. Okay, I think that's uh, enough for me. Uh, I will stop share here so we can all st see each other. All right. Was it too academic? <laughs> uh, but I welcome any questions. Yeah. Uh, David, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, that was really wonderful presentation. Uh, I think there's a lot to, to ponder and consider. And uh, frankly, um, having spent a good bit of time in China, um, but also just in this you know, general topic um, uh, and the idea mm -hmm. and the communication, 
Um, it's really interesting, but it's also new for me. I, I, I guess it, I'm always learning more yes. so much. So yeah. this is kind of a, yeah. just more of a pragmatic kind of thing, yeah. but, but when, yes. when, when a, a relationship kind of has that quality of mochi, it's a possessive yes. state that two or more may have. Yes. Because yes. as you noted, um, it's frequent, right? There's a frequent act right. set of actions that occur, which affirm this condition mm -hmm. of the relationship. So my question yeah, is yes. how mm -hmm. often or how ubiquitous is the, yeah. is the action of those two people Mm -mm. To say to say and confirm by articulating woman yo chi a yo mo chi. Yeah, I mean, is, that, yeah. is that is that mm. the way it goes though? Do people say we have it often, or is it just stated once and never again? Because it's almost the paradox. It's more about frequency of interaction, yes. mm. but the term yes. itself carries more mm. value if it's not uttered much. Is that the way that is? So for mo chi, it's actually not really the case and people actually say it i say they hey we, we have mochi, uh. okay. and we, then the, the delight for <laughs> expression see. will appear yes because both okay. feel the same yeah yes okay uh -huh. so could yeah. it then be that could it then have a risk of being overused and then therefore inauthentic yeah so overuse is um happens in the situation when the other party actually did not feel that way yeah, that is not good. <laughs> right. So in when the you fact, say we'll negative, but that person didn't feel it. Yeah, that would be negative. Yeah, it's like you didn't really get it. You know, I didn't feel that way. So it has to be like a neutral, neutral. And, it, and it, that feeling is like really, really positive. Yeah. I understand. Okay. Thank mm. you. That's helpful. Thank mm. you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, Penny, then Beth. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I think it was a really great discussion. I've actually had some students make a comment. So this was really helpful to have that <laughs> background and understanding. As you were mm. speaking, one of the um, concepts that came to mind for me was Carl yeah. Weick's uh, work in sense making and mm -hmm. how yeah. individuals come together and after they've experienced, then they can have that connection. I put the the link in the, the, the mm -hmm. chat. Um, yeah, thank you. I was just curious mm -hmm. if you've had some connection with uh, some of Carl Weick's work. Yeah, so in this paper, we didn't talk about that. But um, so sense making, much would happen when two people have the same sort of make the same sense out of a situation, right? Without discussing with each other first. Yeah, excellent, excellent point. So that's the connection. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, Beth? Yeah, so I'm coming at it more from a practitioner's side as opposed to the academic one right now. And, um, <laughs> good, good. Yeah. The big question I have, I work with a lot of uh, student groups and mm -hmm. students who are coming from very different cultural backgrounds. And so it seems yes. like there's the opportunity for that misapplication where you've got people coming from different uh, cultural practices and they yeah. one thinks that they've connected and the other one doesn't. Um, are there ways to kind of uh, jumpstart that level of connection when you have people whose you know, demographics are so different? Are there exercises or uh, you know, resources yes, you could point yes. to? Mm. So what we uh, what I do with my students is um, they will do the IC edge assessment first. So they all understand each other's communication style because oftentimes I think my uh, students from Asian countries, they feel that the um, like American students are too aggressive. They, they say things too directly and they, they just feel like, oh gosh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's so on my face, <laughs> I feel, feel very bad. But once they understand their communication style is just like that, you know, they will feel so much better. It's not like they have something about like they don't like me or you know they have some opinion about me. It's just their communication stuff. So that helps a huge, just a great deal. And then of course in class we'll talk about what it means, right? When you have different communication styles and how do you leverage that and how do you overcome the differences? And suddenly they they start also we start talk about. Yeah, cultural background, like why I feel 
so sort of offended when you you know said that last time and start to reflect on that and that helps a great deal yeah um, other questions you know in china um oftentimes <laughs> i i hear like uh you know husband and wife right wife often i have a lot of friends who are uh you know the wife uh, role and they would say like you know we've been living together for so long but we still don't have mochi <laughs> like i still need to tell him to like give me gifts or like buy me flowers you know on valentine's day and so and he would still ask me like what do you want that's like that's not good i the, the ideal situation is that without me asking or saying anything my husband already you know get all the stuff that i wanted <laughs> that that is real mochi <laughs> but, but if one of the if, if one of the two spouses should say it and the yeah. other uh, explicitly denies it that could be even more yeah. dramatic, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, so maybe yeah. it's a a, hu a humorous in a, a humorous suggestion before it's understood as a confirmed that's, one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> so what if one shopping? What if one person yeah. in a like a wife uh -huh. husband, wife one person has more of an in, independent mindset, another yes. person more interdependent mindset. Yeah, what happens yeah. In this situation. Ah, uh, it happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> then they will have some you know not so pleasant kind of <laughs> and it, of course eventually it will be resolved right but right. still um they they um not expect they they hope that, that much you think would happen and that was the best feeling you know but if if you know that your husband would never guess it right, then you you, you better just tell him. <laughs> Otherwise, you get the wrong stuff, or he just totally forgets, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Um, yeah, Chris. Uh, unmute. Unmute. Um, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, mm -hmm. I was uh, joking with Darla in chat. Um, I worked for an agency for many years where there was a group of yeah. women, women, in fact, who had worked uh -huh. together for close to 30 years. Yes. And okay. they would, they would go yeah. into meetings to plan a big event. And I couldn't track yes. anything they said. They would just talk and nod and little half sentences. And, <laughs> great, you know, great. Raise an mm -hmm. eyebrow and and they would they would work out all these things and I'd leave the room and going I have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> uh -huh. Perfect, perfect. That's the best state of the uh, group work because they yeah. understand each other so well. Perfect. No words needed. Yeah, and just one eyebrow raised. They know exactly what it means and what needs to be done <laughs> it was perfect they so just knew good. exactly yeah. how did you know to put it on the left and make it purple i have no idea <laughs> they always knew <laughs> great yeah so you observe that yeah that is the group level mochi so in um in psychology or in groups that research we have this transacting memory uh system that notion that is everyone in the group knows who does what and and when and uh, very well just from previous interactions um they already developed their knowledge so there is sort of a similar um construct there um to describe that situation but much is more than that because it's not just about work but also about you know not just work like beyond work that feeling uh, as well um uh, some yeah uh, valley I mean, here's a question though can can too much mochi though like be not yeah. good in terms of not allowing for um different perspectives and looking at a problem in a you know in a different or more creative way I, i'm just thinking about how too much of a good thing mm. It's mm -hmm. like group think that like sort of doesn't allow outsiders mm -hmm. to feel like like they can. <laughs> okay, good, 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 uh, good uh, thinking. Yes. 
So if we like we have mochi, right? We don't need to say anything. Um, or sometimes we speak to each other. I say using like codes. I mean the, the things only we understand, right? So that could have an uh, effect of exclude excluding other people to join the conversation. And a actually a more um, real situation is this. So for me uh, at University of Washington, we have this faculty lounge place, right? So oftentimes that we go there and you know, heat our lunch and then we um, meet our colleagues. So some of my colleagues are originally from, from China. So if he or she is the only person there, we just talk in Chinese, you know, that's very natural for us, right? And then someone else comes in, of course, uh, that person does not understand Chinese. So we will immediately switch to English because otherwise th they will have that feeling that you guys are like excluding me into the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we do need to sort of to be um, cognizant of that for two people to have like always have watch you, right? Or you have your own system of communication um, to prevent that kind of feeling on uh, others. Yeah. Uh, Nadi, yes. Uh, thank you for your uh, nice presentation. It was uh, really uh, insightful for me. Uh, uh, one uh, great question uh, come up uh, for me from my uh, yeah. previous studies uh, based on yeah. uh, Gladikhan's model of uh, intercultural communication. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you are, you know, just uh, there are uh, two uh, uh, two factors of anxiety and uh, uncertainty would be uh, uh, influential mm -hmm. in this model. Uh, how mm -hmm. much it would be uh, 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 play a role in this model? How can mm -hmm. we put much in uh, reducing or maybe uh, maybe yeah. increasing? Uh, uncertainty and anxiety. Mm, excellent question. So uh, for Mochi, for the two people involved in that state, right? So, you know, you and I have Mochi. That means the uncertainty will be greatly reduced because I sort of, I know how you will react to that situation. Uh, you know, from previous uh, experiences and our interaction, I already knew. So that will be greatly reduced. So that's so in general, mochi is a very, very good feeling. Um, it actually, it's a, such a wonderful feeling. <laughs> um, and in most cases, for it, it's all so positive for the people who are involved in that state. So for people outside, as Valley said, they probably feel, mm, I cannot get into this sort of circle, right? Um, you have that, I don't, and I feel I'm an outsider. Um, but for people within, yeah. It helps a lot. Mm. Just to, yeah, you know, just uh, I think that uh, uh, it uh, it also would be a danger of autopilot, where, uh, mm. when mm. Uh, when uh, the, someone uh, just feel that uh, we we can receive the uh, the uh, yes. this mm. messages and uh, it's uh, just that uh, it would be also a danger of uh, mm. Mm. maybe just misunderstanding. Uh -huh. So that means you cannot assume, like the next in the next situation, you will definitely have more chi. You can. So it's the model that I presented. Only the the overlap part, right? Because something happened in the past about that person, for example, and you reached agreement and you totally agree with what we should do about that person. Then exactly this new situation occurs, and that new situation, that part, they overlap completely. And in that time, you know exactly what the other person would like to do about that person. Okay. So in when it's not a complete overlap, you can only we say engage in guesswork. So like last time we talked about this about the person. Now the new situation happened. I cannot assume we must have mochi this time again. I will guess that what you would think about the situation and what you probably would like to do but I'm not sure. So the uncertainty is still there. That's why we say mochi is person, a target specific and the situation specific. So it's an emergent state 
informed by previous interaction. So you cannot be sure. Yeah. Keep that in mind. It just like maybe a higher probability that, you know, uh, you will achieve agreement than with another person, but no 100% guarantee. Yeah. Okay, great. Any other thoughts? I think we're already on a time. <laughs> okay, David, yeah. I promise my last one. But um, could I, <laughs> if, if Mochi is breached, destroyed, if it was genuinely mm. a state of possession for two people, yes, and it's yes. then breached, let's say, mm. is it irreparable or is it only a potential factor mm. to be even further strengthen the condition that it once was? Because um, if, if if there's something like betrayal or mistrust, can it be yeah. regained if I put it in that frame? Yeah, so mochi is very different from trust because mochi is just a state of, you know, which agreement or shared understanding about something and uh, act accordingly. Next time, when, whether you're going to have mochi or not, we don't know. Like no one yes. knows. Okay, yeah, yeah. I understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, that's it, I guess. Thank you so, <laughs> so much. nice. Yeah, so nice to uh, have you in this session and great discussions, great questions. Okay, hope to see you again in the future. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Have um, a great weekend. Yeah. February 9th, uh, 12 to 1 Eastern Time. Uh, we hope to see you um, for the next uh, Lunch and Learn. Um, yeah. In the meantime, uh, don't be a stranger. Just email, call, uh, stay connected. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a nice yeah. time. Yeah. You too. Thank you. Great. Um, Thanks, so Jeff. I'm going to end You're the recording. Welcome. Okay. And you have all the comments there, right? Maybe you can um, uh, email me that. Yes. Um, yeah. Hold on just a second. Wait, hold on. Um, yeah, because I think later.